When Diagon Alley opened at Universal Studios Florida in 2014, it became the immediate success that the creative team had hoped for, opening two new high-tech dark rides, Harry Potter and the Escape from Gringotts, and the Hogwarts Express. However, the arrival of Diagon Alley also marked the end of one of the park's original opening day attractions, Jaws the Ride. A high-stakes escape from a 20-foot Great White that soon became a staple of the park and worked reliably almost never. Welcome to Amusement Labs, where today I'll explain the history, engineering, and technology behind both versions of Jaws the Ride. This video is brought to you by generous patrons, especially Levi Valentine, at patreon.com slash amusement labs. Formerly located at Universal Studios Florida in Orlando, Jaws the Ride was a water-based attraction in the Amity Island section in the rear of the park. This six-minute long boat adventure around Amity Island, all lifted from the iconic Universal film franchise Jaws, was often described as the Jungle Cruise but with teeth. Originally slated to open with the park in 1989, Jaws, along with the entirety of the Universal Studios Florida, was not ready and inevitably pushed later and later into 1990, limping to the opening on June 7, 1990. Despite its history, what the original Jaws ride aimed to do had not only never been done before, but was years ahead of its time, something that would prove to be its downfall. For this park, Universal ditched the Orlando Tram Tour idea and expanded on the attractions of their Hollywood Tram Tour, developing them into standalone rides. For Jaws, Universal, owned by MCA at the time, brought on ride and show engineering in the late 80s to devise, assemble, and construct the ride, the boats, and the effects. This tall order, of course, included eight 20 foot articulated waterproof robotic sharks. Or at least they thought they were waterproof. In much the same way that the original Jaws movie was wildly over budget and faced numerous mechanical issues with the film's multi ton robotic sharks, Jaws the Ride would face a similar fate. The original 1990 version of Jaws the Ride was designed to use a fleet of aesthetically flimsy platform boats for a live actor to tour guests around Amity Island. While the original version was not experienced by many, it did feature a number of ambitious scenes and effects. Shortly after pushing off from load, Amity 3, the boat ahead, would send a distress call only for guests to turn a corner and see Amity 3 sinking. By using the back half section of a boat mounted to a wheeled sled, the half boat would be pulled downward into a ditch, sinking the boat. The first of the eight sharks would rise to the surface using a folding lift mechanism and was dragged via cable along a separate track. It would then lower for a switch to the second shark on the other side of the boat, making guests believe the shark had swam under the boat. For both these sharks, only basic undetailed shark bodies were used, but included articulated fins for effect. The underwater pass effect was also accompanied by a rolling motion of the boat. The skipper would take a prop grenade launcher and pretend to fire it at the shark, pairing it with shots from underwater water cannons. Once out of view, the sharks would be set backwards for the next boat. Taking shelter inside the dark boathouse, a third shark would seemingly break through the boathouse's wall. For this, a rather featureless shark was pushed through the wall on a track out and into the water, shielded by the darkness. Additionally, three canoes were also suspended by cables from the ceiling and splashed down into the water by unlocking reels of the cable hidden in the rafters. Soon after, guests came face to face with Bruce, as the 1990s realistic thrashing and hungry full-length animatronic shark burst from the water and chomped as it made its way down the boat. After getting the boat back into gear, the skipper would escape the boathouse only to again run into Bruce right outside. One of the ride's most ambitious and often unreliable effects was when Bruce would surface again, pretend to bite and turn the boat by backing up along a circular track. The boat would also rotate at about the center via an underwater hydraulic actuator, and by matching the rotation, speed, and radius of the turn, it made it appear that Bruce was in control. Turning forward again, the boat would escape only for Bruce Shark number 6 to surface and head towards the boat. Much like in the beginning, the boat would roll as Bruce seemingly passed underneath and resurfaced again, Shark number 7, going in for the kill. The skipper would fire another grenade into Bruce's mouth just as he dove under the boat, disappearing again, rolling the boat once more. The finale of the original Jaws the Ride involved what designers dubbed the Meat Machine that would recreate the explosion and gory end of Bruce from the first film. This was achieved by loading fake shark bits into an air cannon that would fire along with gallons of red dyed water. The entire effect was contained in a hidden funnel-like structure 
It would then funnel the pieces back into the now lowered cannon to ready for the next boat. The boat would then return to the dock where guests could unload. And that's how the original version of Jaws the Ride worked. Or at least what would have happened if the ride ever ran reliably. Truth be told, on opening day, Jaws was less than ready. I have to tell you that Jay Bilwock says earlier in the day, things weren't quite so right. Universal's first day opened to mixed reviews. I flew in from New York about a week ago, and I look forward to it, but it's a big disappointment. Yes. I don't think they were quite ready. I think they need a little more run through. But run at Universal did, leading to immediate breakdowns, stranding guests out on the Seven Acre Lake. Universal says that rides had to be taken offline today for fine-tuning, mostly of their computer software. Universal pushed and pushed to get Jaws ready and running reliably within the week the park opened, but after just under three months, they threw in the towel, removing signage and references to Jaws and commercials, not wanting to disappoint guests. But it was already too late. Distraught and furious, Universal sued Ride and Show Engineering, citing poor design, among other things while Ride and Show Engineering cited Universal's pressure to open when the ride wasn't ready. But even given the delays, the ride was never really ready. Everybody enjoy your tour of the bed? What was working, right? <laughs> Showing a number of major design flaws, such as the meat machine not being ready due to constant jamming during the recollection sequence, and sub-quality boats leading to railings breaking off. Plus, every single articulated shark was designed using pneumatic or air actuators and controls that, turns out, were not watertight. This combined with trying to move a 3-ton robotic shark that was definitely not aerodynamic needed a lot of power which the design could barely provide. As a result, there was no guarantee that each shark would even show up during the ride. Redesigning the ride over a couple of years, Universal scrapped nearly all of the original Jaws sharks, boats, and effects, and bringing on totally fun company to lead it to redesign. This saw a new boat design from Intamin that was built by Regal Marine Industries and track redone by local Nazao Co. Universal also brought on Eastport International, which later became a part of Oceaneering, to redesign and build seven new sharks, and iTech Productions would work to write software that would bring the entire ride together. The new Jaws the Ride would reopen in spring of 1993. Changes were immediately apparent, starting with the boats that placed their weight on four road wheels atop a concrete rail. In the back of the boat was a diesel engine and underseat tank that was filled each day by skippers. This engine was not responsible for turning a propeller, but would pressurize and move four hydraulic motors with attached wheels that ran on the inside of the track. Pressurized actuators ensured that those wheels were pressed firmly against the track for grip. The entire boat was hinged just below the surface to a hydraulic piston that would tilt the boat from side to side, the rolling effect. All of this was controlled by a computer in the back of the boat, near the engine, and controls for the skipper, along with a fake steering wheel, were in the front. When dispatch was pressed on the panel, the boat would talk to the main ride computer, located in the building to the right as the boat left the dock. The motors would silently kick in, and the show began. Much like the first version, the effects, including the sharks, were originally on a timer, with effects being triggered in a wave that followed the boat. When the boats would dispatch, they were simply being let in to match the wave of the effects. In the second version, the sinking Amity 3 was changed as well to match the new boats, but the mechanics remained the same. The first two sharks were recreated using simple dorsal fins on a similar track, raised now via scissor lift, but were not articulated. The inside of the boathouse saw changes with the wall bursting shark being removed in favor of other misdirection effects. While some fans bemoaned the change to a less realistic shark, the more reliable hydraulic calf Bruce would surface and move past the boat. The falling boats were probably the only effect to go rather untouched in this change. Exiting the boathouse, riders were met with a new gas dock scene that would flush out the backside of Amity Island. Much like the boathouse, another hydraulic calf bruise would burst from the water where the skipper would miss, accidentally shooting the gas dock. Here, an intense propane-based effects panel released propane gas from pipes both on the dock and underwater, forming a visual wall of fire trapping the boat. Eventually, the fire would die down and the boat would escape. Instead of reworking the Meat Machine's creation of the first Jaws film, the effect was ripped out entirely and covered up with a prop boat. 
In its place on the left, two more sharks join the final dorsal fin Bruce, recreated just like the first two. Dorsal fin Bruce resurfaces, dives, and another articulated half Bruce lunged at the boat, also biting a high voltage line accompanied by scented steam, more water cannon blasts, and what's called a cold spark machine. This Bruce animatronic would sink only for a charred and gory Bruce body to resurface. Relieved, your skipper would then triumphantly drive the boat away back to the dock where guests unloaded and reminisced about the shark they definitely didn't see on Amity Island. After 20 years and a one month notice, Jaws the Ride officially closed at 9 p.m. on January 2nd, 2012 at Universal Studios Florida, with Michael Skipper piloting the final voyage around Amity Island. This fun and well thought out experience allowed guests to enjoy a classic peaceful journey gone awry with a thrilling adventure through the classic franchise. While Jaws the Ride is no more with Diagon Alley open, it shows that Universal's commitment to technological immersion and their willingness to pave the way for newer, grander experiences goes way back, even if it means letting a fan favorite sail off into the sunset. And that's how Jaws the Ride worked. If you liked this video, please subscribe, and if you like what we do, consider joining our Patreon for early access. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the parks.